Thank you all for coming. It's nice to see so many people from OCAC here. Thank you for coming on the sat on the Sunday. Can you guys hear me if I, I talk at this level? Okay. Um, so I, I thought I'd start my lecture by talking about um, this image here, which is an illustration from a Polish folktale called the Snow Maiden. Um, and in the Snow Maiden, the story goes that essentially a pile of snow responds to the prayers of a childless couple and the snow transforms into a little girl. Um, and the little girl and her parents live a relatively happy life until one day the girl participates in a game with village children where she jumps over a fire and immediately evaporates. I'm interested in how we mythologize natural phenomena and transformation, such as evaporation and decay, into cultural stories and symbols. Folklore and mythology are full of stories about transformation and explanations for natural phenomena. Early Western scientific study combines spiritual allegory with transmutation, defining chemical reactions as chemical weddings and illustrating chemistry through Rosicrucian symbols and Christian allegories. In contemporary popular culture, early myths about the supernatural are ever present. They are represented in the media, urban legends, and new waves of spirituality. In my own work, mythology, scientific history, and new age idealism become starting points for an investigation into the creation of meaning and the formation of knowledge. In my work, I strive to create work that explores transformation and the cultural creation of the natural world while simultaneously highlighting the transformation of materials within the piece and the transformation of the work of the space around the pieces. In this installation titled White Room, I hung large netted sculptural forms from the ceiling to create a large, an immersive ethereal space. Um, the goal of this piece was to create a, a space that felt ethereal and beautiful while also feeling heavy and, um, and unsettling at the same time. And while I was making this piece, I thought a lot about what it, what it meant to be underwater and how it feels to be underneath the ocean, where your sense, of, um, your sense of location kind of shifts from up to down. And there are large masses of plant life and animals that kind of get swashed, swished around, and it all becomes kind of unsettled. Um, to make this work, I cut up and reconnected industrial netting, military camouflage netting, and also made my own netting and coated it in thick layers of white paint um, and then hung them all over the gallery space. And the result of this was it looked a lot like parasitic plants, particularly ivy and kudzu. Um, and through coating these materials and mimicking nat the natural world, they became kind of a, a combination, a hybrid of natural and synthetic accumulation. Um, and then in the surface of these forms, I started inserting chandelier crystals to signal that some kind of natural growth and transformation was happening. And I also wanted them to start reflecting light onto the pieces. And I realize now that this is one of the first times that glass started to appear in my work. And it really has a pivotal role in these pieces. And I also like the chandelier crystals because they come from a decorative history. And so it was taking these natural mimetic forms that were a little bit ugly, a little bit rough, and starting to turn them into something that um, referenced the decorative arts and something that was supposed to be um, kind of a, a pre-made sense of beautiful. Um, and while I was making these pieces, I started to reconsider what it meant to mimic the natural world and construct spaces that were meant to convey a sense of beauty. Um, it felt problematic to create a constructed space without identifying it as such um, in a world that's pretty much already made of constructed artificial environments and experiences. So in response to that, I made this next piece, which is called White Grotto. Um, just to give you a sense of reference, these pieces are all from about four years ago. Um, so they are kind of older pieces for me, but still are, are pretty fresh. Um, White Grotto was a reflection on um, <clears throat> constructed spaces and constructed viewpoints. Um, it is literally a 
a constructed space, and the way it's made doesn't hide the hand of the maker. Um, unlike the pieces like White Room, which I showed previously, which were all about kind of hiding, hiding the hand that made them and making it look as if it had just kind of naturally formed itself. Historically, grottos are personal spaces reflecting the desire to create an inner world. Um, and they are spaces that traditionally mimic the natural and romanticize nature. Um, I built the, the shape of this grotto to reference a jewelry box, a gemstone, and a geode. The exterior of it is built out of everyday materials. It's just plywood and flat, um, flat latex house paint. paint. Um, in contrast to the exterior, which is very glossy and shiny inside. Um, and then the entrance to the space was a four foot high cut out of a heart. And because of the height of the doorway, the viewer had to bend down to enter the space, signaling that they were entering a new space and crossing a threshold. And uh, I chose to make it vaguely heart shaped because I wanted it to reference Tunnel of Love amusement park rides and King Ludwig's famous Venus Grotto, and also to signal, signal that you were entering a romantic uh, space. Um, and then the shape of the, of, this, um, of the doorway kind of creates a little vignette of the person that's inside of it as well. So it starts to reference a diorama, composition, and display. Um, the interior of it is built out of heavily painted spray foam and polystyrene. I built these um, two swan sculptures that I wired to function as lamps. So they, they are what lit, lights the whole interior. And um, I thought it was interesting to take a swan, which is a wild animal that's already been turned into a symbol of romance, of love, of Hallmark love. Um, and turn it into something that's functional and decorative. So in this piece, they lose their wild status as an animal and have turned into something that's purely decorative and also functional. Um, and then all kind of the silver spots around the whole exterior are inset mirrors. And so they bounce light around. And then they also bounce around the reflection of the viewer. So it really becomes about being a personal space and a contained space. Um, this is a, a shot of this little girl who walked in with symmetrical hair, <laughs> which I, I thought was pretty great. Thank you to her parents, also for wearing little yellow socks. Um, and again, this idea that it becomes kind of a space, a little vestibule space for the viewer, um, very much like a jewelry box. And you can see on closer inspection that you, the corrugated surface of cardboard is apparent. Hot glue is apparent. It's very much about being kind of a sloppy, constructed space. And then throughout the piece, the piece, I also inset these large glass diamonds, which again are a symbol of the romantic. Um, and they also reference the, con the magical connotations of glass. So again, glass being inserted into the work as this moment for, um, of decorative beauty, of transformative beauty. Um, and also a contrast to this really matte surface that I was creating. Um, the next piece that I made was called Hylozoic. And I made this when I first moved to Portland. And um, this piece is a significant shift for me because I went from creating immersive environments to creating a singular object in a space that created an environment. So this piece is 15 feet tall. And uh, the platform around it is made out of um, cob. It's all filled in with cob clay that was dyed with uh, natural dyes. And so when you actually were in front of it, it looked like kind of a natural earthen surface. And so people during the exhibition could walk around it and be very close to this large form. When I, when I moved to Oregon, I was struck by just the, the mammoth size of the natural wild wilderness here. Um, we constantly see Mount Hood in the distance. You know, there's always these monolithic forms. And I was also struck by how um, there are these large forms and then these small forms in Oregon. So if you go out into the woods, you'll see little tiny ecosystems where um, one mushroom or one plant will be growing off of a rock and then something comes off of that. So um, this was my attempt to make a little island. 
Um, the whole piece is made out of foam and cardboard and then coated with uh, enamel and burlap. And so when you're in front of it, it really looks like it's kind of shifting a little bit. It looks, it's supposed to be one form that's kind of shift, in shift, in flux, and um, referencing this idea of material in constant motion. Um, and then the next section of work I want to talk about is my glass work. So from here, I, I really started to think more about glass and think more about making translucent work and think more about the materials I was using. In my previous pieces, um, like Hylozoic, it really was a lot of materials kind of clumped together in the shape of something, which was interesting to me um, coming from this idea of being interested in the synthetic and the synthetic mimicking the natural world. But I wanted to really hone in on what materials I was using and why. And so now when I, when I approach a material, I think about each material's cultural history and its ability to impart meaning. And glass, with its rich aesthetic, scientific, and practical history, represents preservation while simultaneously signifying fragility and temporality. Um, in my work, this duality is emphasized as organic forms often frozen in the midst of life and death cycles melt and shapeshift kind of like some of the pieces in the back over there. And casting these forms in a translucent, crystal-like material draws upon the countless fairy tales and stories that explain natural occurrences as myths. And uh, my favorite story that incorporates glass is the folk tale called The Glass Mountain, sometimes called as um, Seven Ravens. And um, in this story, seven brothers are transformed by a curse into ravens. And there's one, one sister in the family, and she has the task of going to, um, to find the magic potion or whatever to save them, essentially. And to find that, she has to enter into a glass mountain, which is very hard to enter into because it's slippery and it's constantly, the light's constantly shifting off of it. Um, and she's given a wishbone by um, some magical person that she meets on the way to enter in, and that's the magical key to get into this glass mountain. But when she gets there, she realizes that she's lost the wishbone, and so she relies on her own resourcefulness and her body to enter into the building. And so what she does is she actually cuts off her finger and sticks it in because it's another bone to turn the key into this mountain and into the domain of these transformed brothers and then saves everybody. But I just think that's a great example of um, glass and a story and then also the body coming into it. And fingers and bones kind of come into my work again. So, but I thought I'd take a moment to show this illustration. Um, and so the first work that I made in glass uh, were these two pieces, fairy tale trees in the background and portal in the front for a show here um, with Michael Endo called of other, of other Spaces. And the painting in the back is Michael's. Um, and for both of these pieces, I decided I wanted to reference the idea of a magical space and a thresh crossing a threshold to a magical space, but I didn't want to actually show the magical space. Um, in my previous pieces, like White Room and White Grotto, I was trying very hard to show people what I thought they wanted to see or what I wanted to see as a child. And I decided that I think it's more poignant to not show that and just show give you something that makes you think about the potential to go somewhere else and that we put all this potential in inanimate objects and really maybe that space doesn't exist, it just exists in our minds. So I, to me, I find that a little bit more interesting now. Um, this piece called Portal um, references the life and death cycles of an ink cap mushroom. And an ink cap mushroom actually as it dies, it releases its spores and melts into a puddle of ink. And um, someone told me about it one day, and I, I just couldn't get it out of my head. So I started making all these mushroom pieces because I just love this idea of um, something decaying and turning into a puddle, especially, especially also because I like mound forms. And so just turning into a pile I thought was pretty nice. Um, so each one of these is cast out of white glass. And I set them up in a circle to reference a fairy ring which in folk, tale is, folk tales 
Um, that's how m when mushrooms grow in a circle, there's all these stories about fairies dancing in a circle or witches dancing in a circle, and that if you step into one, it'll take you into another space. I also think it looks a little bit like a little tiara. <laughs> so here's a close-up. Um, and then this piece is called Fairy Tale Trees, and it's made out of steel and um, resin, enamel, a few branches, and uh, glass. There's glass fruit and glass mushrooms growing on the, on the trunks. A lot of people think that these are actually just painted black trees, but they're predominantly steel. Um, and these trees come together kind of in a heart shape, um, again, becoming another archway that you could walk under and enter into another space. Um, but it's not really clear if that other space exists, and that space is probably just psychological. Um, in this piece, the shadows played a large role as well. So here's a um, close-up of the branches and the glass fruit. Um, there are a lot of fairy tales where people eat glass fruit, or not glass fruit, they eat magical fruit, um, and go somewhere else. And then here's some glass mushrooms kind of growing on the, the stalks of the trees. Um, so after making those two pieces, I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to remake the portal piece, but make it a little bit more complicated and really think more about what happens when one thing turns into another thing and explore that idea more. So I made this piece at the Vestibule Gallery in, um, in Disjecta. And it's really just a, a shotgun hallway. And so um, it kind of brought up all these different um, problems with how to install something in there. So I decided I wanted to make these little specimen plates that just kind of hung in the space, almost as if they were on a table themselves. So I'll show some pictures of people walking around them. But they were hung, so they're kind of right below eye level. So they feel like they're on a suspended little table. Um, each one of these pieces goes through a different uh, life and death cycle. They started by being two different rocks um, on either side. And then they go through different transitions. They go through a shape shift, a color shift, um, and then turn back into the original rock form. And there's 74 of them. And um, they all weigh the exact same amount. And I, I thought that was interesting because really when it comes down to it, it's just one material shifting into different forms. And I've become really interested in this idea of materiality and um, what's real and what's fiction and showing something where it's really just glass in a bunch of different shapes and it's the same amount of glass felt um, like a very satisfying relationship to me. Um, on a side note, the rock forms, I collected the original forms out in the desert. They're obsidian forms and then made molds of them. And um, the sticks were collected. A lot of the pieces were collected in Oregon. So here's um, a picture of the piece installed. And my favorite thing about it was actually how people moved around the pieces. They ended up walking in these lines kind of right up next to the work and kind of around it. And I think it's interesting to, to suspend a material like glass that is considered so precious and fragile. And when you suspend a piece of glass in a room, all of a sudden people become a lot more aware of how their body is moving around it and their vicinity and relationship to the material. Um, and I chose these kind of gem-like colors because I thought of them as these little, kind of these little gems. And for me it's been really satisfying to go from working with kind of um, disposable everyday materials like foam to working with the antithesis of that which is this glass material. Um, and I think that they need each other. I think it's interesting to have um, a body of work that contains both of them. Um, this next piece is called Crystalline Conversion. And it's a similar piece. It was part of the Chroma Culture show here last summer. And um, one of my favorite things about this piece is the shadows, which I really can't take credit for. It was really the um, exhibition designer here, Ryan Boynton, who 
figured out how to do those shadows in that lovely pattern that kind of looks like a lunar calendar. Um, working with glass has, has shifted how I think about making and shifted my process a lot. Um, before, I was doing a lot of things where it was really just about accumulation, but when you're casting glass, you, you have to think about the amount of volume and the, um, the weight and how things change from volume to, you know, how much, equal, how much glass equals one thing and another thing. And it's, it's made me think a lot about alchemy and about um, weight and measurements, which has started to influence my work. Um, I also shifted to making predominantly glass work, uh, um, clear work. And um, that's because I wanted the work to reference glass as a material, the history of glass. Um, and really, it's about the fact that it's in glass. It's not an accident. Um, so making this work where I was weighing everything out, thinking about one thing being each piece being the exact same amount um, and vol same volume uh, made me think a lot about alchemy and what does it mean to be thinking about trying to uh, transform different materials. So I started doing all this research online about alchemy and I realized that it was really hard to figure out what you were reading and where all the sources were coming from. I wasn't sure if I was actually finding facts or if I was just reading Harry Potter fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to um, go to the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale. And I met with the head curator there, Catherine James. And she showed me their incredible um, alchemy and um, their alchemy manuscript collection that dates from the 1400s to the 1700s. It's really pretty amazing. Uh, this is the Beinecke Library. <coughs> and um, it's, a, it's a really amazing building because the exterior of it just looks like a concrete modernist building. But when you go inside, all the books are housed in this glass, um, in, in this glass centerpiece going through the whole building. So you're just walking around kind of this glass tower of books. It's really a beautiful building. Um, so this is what their research library section looked like in the 50s. It still looks like that. It's not me researching, but someone else. Um, so I went and looked at their books. And the interesting thing about their book collection is it was compiled by Mary Mellon, who um, was one of the major supporters of Carl Jung and Jungian psychology. And she went through all his teachings and um, tried to collect all these books and manuscripts that he referenced in his research on archetypes. And so um, this whole collection is really based around um, Jungian theory. And um, Mary Mellon and her whole kind of circle of lady friends were responsible for bringing Carl Jung over to the US and um, got him all these teaching, these lecture tours, and um, really gave him a voice in the state. So it's a really interesting collection um, for multiple reasons. Um, oh, this image is really interesting. The books themselves are going through a transformation. They're actually falling apart due to the, um, the ink that they were written with written on with, so they've kind of um, decayed into these really lacy pages. And then each book has been rebound so many times that um, they're really their own. They've all gone through a transformation. Um, these are some images from the Voynich Manuscript, um, which is a pretty incredible book that has a whole cult following around it. Um, it's a very early botanical manuscript from, I believe, the 1400s. And it's written in a language that no one understands. Um, there's all these uh, mystery novels about it and art pieces about it and um, you know, all these thoughts about, well, maybe, it was, maybe it's a fake. Maybe it contains the most important knowledge ever. You know, it's this really amazing, amazing book. And it has these gorgeous drawings on all these vellum pages of very crude uh, plants. It's really a lovely book. Um, so these are just some images I took while I was at the library. One of the things that I thought that was so interesting at the library was that um, all these alchemists started, they, they, took so, they went to so many pains to code their findings. <laughs> um, and 
they, so they, they wrote in all these different, they wrote in code, then they wrote backwards in code and sandwiched different pieces on top of other pieces. So this Phoenix drawing, it has writing in back, backwards on it and it's pasted over other writing and then someone went in and made these little addendums. It's really interesting because I don't know who they were hiding their knowledge from. And um, I think there was probably a scribe who was writing everything down for them. So there's also this kind of interesting uh, exchange between where this knowledge was going and, and it's really interesting. The whole time I was there, um, I really was struck by, I had this big plan to make all these draw drawings based on this collection and I'm still hoping to do it but the whole time I was there I was really just struck by why I was there in the first place and who I thought I was. I kind of felt like I had this big magnifying glass and I felt a little bit like Hermione Granger, you know, or some, like I was in some kind of mystery novel. And when I talked to Catherine James, the curator, we talked about how um, the interesting thing about rare book collections is that every time someone sits in front of the book, they feel as if they are the next, the next carrier and the next leg of some kind of mystical knowledge. So you feel very implicated in the relationship between book and your context, I guess, and history. You feel like you're part of history. And so that's what really struck, struck me a lot was um, just this feeling of relationship to the object and relationship, you know, I, I thought, what am I searching for? <laughs> Why am I here? Um, but this research trip has started to really permeate my thinking and is coming up more and more. And the symbols that I saw in these ancient books I'm starting to see more and more in popular culture, um, in cartoons, in um, just all these different elements of uh, daily life. And to me, that's really interesting how we have kind of this pop mysticism. So after taking that, doing that research trip, I um, began working on this show, The Realm of Quantifiable Truths. And I started to think um, more about the links between measurement and um, the metaphysical pseudosciences and historic myth making and contemporary spirituality and how measuring something gives us a sense that we're learning something and we get, it gives us a sense that it's relative to something else but sometimes that's all very fuzzy um, and through making the glasswork itself there's so much measuring involved that has really started to capture my imagination um, so for this show, each one of these pieces is titled after a different unit of measurement. Um, the hanging branches are called fathom phenomenon. Um, and they, <coughs> a, a fathom is a six foot length. Um, there's the counting cord, which references counting uh, beads and prayer beads and ink and uh, kipus, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, there's the threaded increments piece the metatonic transfiguration and the divination rods. And rods are actually a surveyor's tool and another unit of measurement. So I really tried to tie that into each piece and consider it while I made each piece in either um, the length of it, the weight of it, or just its relationship to the body. Um, also, the title for the show, The Realm of Quantifiable Truths, um, is a personal reference and homage to Mel Bachner's work, who's, a, um, who's considered one of the founders of conceptual art. And he's made a lot of work about measurement. And um, so I, I did a lot of research on him while I was making this work. And so I found this, I found this essay by Jeffrey Weiss um, for his 27, 2007 Event Horizon exhibition catalog. And in this essay, he referred to Bachner's work as the world, of, the world as a fantasy of quantifiable truth. And I just loved that line. And so I, I thought more about it and what it meant with my own work. And um, I thought about, I chose the word realm because it's kind of a mystical space. It's a little bit unknowable what the edges of that space are. And it's kind of a, a magical folkloric space. And then I thought that the idea of um, a quantifiable, quantifiable truths is kind of an oxymoron. If you have multiple truths, how can you quantify that? Um, and so while I was working on this show, I, 
I really thought about that statement, and I'm still trying to work it out, but that's why I titled the show that, because it's something that I'm still kind of trying to work out, but I, I, um, I thought it was a good overarching title. And then um, this is a quote by Mel Bachner, which I thought was very fitting. He said that measurement is one, of, is one of our means of believing that the world can be reduced to a function of human understanding. Yet when forced to surrender its transparency, measurement reveals an essential nothingness. And I also thought that the word transparency was a nice reference to glass, so <laughs> I put that in too. Um, so uh, the next set of slides are just talking about this show. Um, this piece is called Threaded Increments. And um, it's a large branch that's been cut into sections, kind of like a little tree ring, and then threaded on leather rope, and then tied in knots to reference this idea of time passing. And also the idea of um, knotting as a meditation on time passing um, and on uh, prayer. And there's a long history of knot tying in many different cultures all over the world, dating back to at least the 7th century. Um, but one of the most famous is the Incan quipu. And here's an image of one of them. Um, and this is from the 14, around the 1400s, 1500s. And it was a way of um, recording goods and um, time passing and all sorts of things. And each type of knot and thread type and color of the thread type has a different meaning. So it's a whole coded system in knotting. In knotting. Um, this next piece is called counting cord. And it's a similar threading of um, tree rings, so time passing, threading of the natural, also taking something natural and turning it into something kind of like a necklace, which is decorative. Um, in this show, I also thought a lot about scale shifts and the human body. And I like that um, threaded increments is very large. It almost looks like an arm or a leg. Um, it's a huge necklace. And then this, again, is a slightly smaller, but again, kind of an enlarged necklace. So I hope that when people walk around the show, they, they start to think about the work in relationship to their own bodies, whether it's a micro scale, a macro scale, or a one-to-one -one scale. Um, and in these pieces, I um, incorporated horsehair. And uh, horsehair shows up in folktales. And hair shows up in folktales a lot. Here's an image from the goose girl with the, her dead horse mounted on this tunnel she walks through every day. And then she brushes her hair every day. It's a whole part of the story. Rapunzel has hair that comes into it. Um, so I like this idea of incorporating hair into it. But I also like the idea that um, the hair is a protein. And the leather is a protein. And the uh, glass is kind of this sand and silica mix. So what happens when you put these materials next to one another? Um, what happens when you put them through one another? It's something that um, it's these different material relationships that I personally find are interesting to think about. Um, and then I dyed all the horse hair very lightly. Um, it's all lightly dyed purple. Um, and purple comes up in kind of pop mysticism and pop magic. Everything's purple, which is always where purple. Um, also, um, to kind of reference pop cultural trends, so uh, light grayish purple hair is a big trend right now. And it also kind of references something slightly magical, like a unicorn, something a little bit otherworldly. So here's another detail. Um, this piece is called the divination rods. Um, these pieces are made out of glass, and then they have um, stainless steel brackets that are each in a different geometric shape. Um, and the geometric shapes are all based off of symbols that I saw in the alchemical manuscripts and kind of everyday symbols that we all recognize. So triangles, pentagons, hexagons, stars of David, and then um, hearts too, because it's kind of everyday geometry. And I like the idea that you have something kind of natural growing out of a set shape and how we assign these geometric shapes to understand the organic world around us, but um, something's still growing out of it. And then each one of the branches coming out of them are in reference to the amount of points on the bracket. And the brackets themselves are made out of stainless steel 
and silver solder. And then the tips of all the branches were dipped in silver nitrate, so they're having a chemical reaction at the bottom. So the, the glass itself is going through a transformation. Um, each one of the pieces, too, were made out of um, cast rose stems. And I think roses and brambles are interesting because they come up in the kind of romantic imagery, but also in folktale imagery. They tend to have lives of their own where they grow around things, they protect things. Um, and then each one of these pieces, too, I started to think about um, how fingers become kind of their, a way of pointing and measuring. And I think they look very bone and finger-like. Um, this next piece is called Metonic Transfiguration. And like Hall of Conversion and Crystalline Conversion, um, it illustrates many different life and death cycles. They start as a rock, and then they turn back into a rock again. Um, they also go, this piece also goes through a shape and a, a opacity shift. So they start as something translucent and slowly become more opaque and then turn back translucent again. Um, and the word metonic refers to the metonic cycle, um, which is essentially after a new moon occurs on the same day of the year as the beginning of the cycle. So it's this idea of um, things repeating. Um, all these pieces were, all the pieces that were, these were cast from were found in Portland. So the, um, the stones, the um, branches, and the mushrooms, and a few of the crystals. Um, and then the last piece of the show is called Table of Material Contents. Um, and each element on the table relates to a different piece in the show. The materials used in the exhibition, and as well as the materials used in the exhibition. So um, dyed horsehair, glass, leather, silver nitrate are all present on the table. And the inset into the table surface is a pearlescent acrylic. Um, and it's inset into whitewashed wood. And uh, in this show, I became very interested in the juxtaposition of synthetic and natural materials. And the purple dye and pearlescent acrylic reference pop cultural mysticism. And then the white leather is, again, kind of a coated, whitewashed natural material. Um, and then that brings me to the end of my presentation, where I, I wanted to talk about the research I was doing in Scotland this summer and my next coming exhibition. Um, so this summer, I had a fantastic opportunity to um, spend about a month in northern Scotland teaching a class. Um, and also, thanks to Lonnie McGregor and Bullseye, I was able to spend 10 days working in the Northlands Glass Studio in preparation for the um, exhibition space that's going to be opening in 2016 out there. And I'm making an installation for that exhibition space, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, this is the Northlands Glass Studio. This is a picture of um, the Northlands Glass Studio at night. It takes a while for the sun to set, so you get this great northern light. And that's actually a picture of Marianne Deffenbaugh in the, in the door there, <laughs> working late at night. Um, here's a picture, just so you get a sense of the surroundings. Um, it's kind of like a land that time forgot. So here's a um, <coughs> harbor near the studio. Um, and the environment up there is very otherworldly. There's this heavy mist that rolls in called the har and kind of blankets everything. And there are lots of sheep <laughs> and fields and fog and thistles. Um, so it's a really interesting space. And right now I'm preparing for an exhibition that's going to take place in these refurbished barns in northern Scotland in 2016. Um, the barns, I believe, are from the 17th century. And um, they're in the process of being restored. And they'll be turned into exhibition spaces. So um, I'm going to be making an installation that fills this, this barn. Um, so I started doing some kind of tests out there. I started casting mushrooms from the area and rocks from the area while I was there um, in, the, in the 10 days, just kind of doing some, some sample work. Um, but while I was there, I kept thinking about the folklore from the area, because making the show made me realize um, how much my work is inspired by folklore. 
Um, and one of my favorite stories from northern Scotland and the Orkney Island region, which is very close to where the studio is and the barn is, um, is the story of the Selkie, which is a seal that gets transformed into a woman and trapped and then turns into a seal again. So I started this making these two heads. Um, one's a seal and one's a, um, one's a selkie. And um, the idea was that they would be a transformative pair where they sat kind of submerged in water or submerged in earth looking at each other. But after making this piece, it's funny how, uh, for me, I, I think through making. So after making this piece, I realized that what I was really interested in was just doing more research on um, the folklore of the region and then tying that back into the barn space and finding these artifacts and creating objects from different stories and then having them kind of go through life and death cycles that take over those, um, that exhibition space in Scotland. So my next task is to do some um, very in-depth research on the area and on their myths. Um, while I was there, I shared the studio with Mike Lendo and um, a local artist and architect named Carlin Sutherland. This is Carlin working in the studio. And um, Carlin and I have actually been working together for the past year on different projects. She went out in um, the, na the nearby area to where the barn is and collected mushrooms for me and then actually made molds of them. And I, I love these pictures of her actually making molds in the wild. <laughs> Um, so she made silicone molds for me of mushrooms and then sent the molds back to me. And actually the little mushrooms that are on the table, the table of material contents are from these pieces. But I wanted most of the elements from, to, that were in the barn show that I'm working on um, to be from the region. So she's been collecting these objects for me and sending them back. Um, and in return, I've been helping her measure and photograph um, the other exhibition space that she's working on. Um, one of the other barns, which is a horse stable. And so I thought I'd end my um, talk with just these really lovely pictures because um, Carlin thinks about, she thinks about space and place and light. And one of the ways she photographs light, I, I think it's okay if I reveal this secret, is she goes around and, um, and waves dust in the air and then photographs it really quick. So uh, we took turns wearing these colorful jumpsuits and um, behind the scenes, um, shook dust, shook flour, and then she talked, sh shot these beautiful shots of um, light just kind of captured with all these particles. You'd never know it's flour. Um, but these are some photos, some behind the scene photos. Uh, this is Carlin. And to me, it looks like she's chasing light, which I thought was really great. And here's me helping. <laughs> chase the light in Scotland. Um, so I thought this would be a good end, note to end on. And um, thank you for listening to this whole lecture. I don't know if anyone has any questions, um, but thank you. <laughs>